All right. Uh, thank you all for coming out this morning. Um, and thank you for attending Coins in the Kingdom. And of course, uh, thanks a lot, uh, MK Lords, Jason King, and everybody who's working hard to make this happen, all the videographers and journalists and everyone that's coming out to support the conference. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, this presentation is going to be about basic Bitcoin security, but also some some of the more advanced things that are important to know. Uh, the last presentation uh, with Will and Lee went over some of the basics, uh, particularly around creating paper wallets. Uh, we're going to go into a little bit deeper of what it means to really be secure uh, when you're using Bitcoin, because for the first time, um, people are truly in control of their money, and um, it's kind of scary. So, uh, you know, be, be Your Own Bank is really great uh, uh, as an idea until you realize that banks get robbed a lot. So, um, or at least there's certainly a threat there. So there's a reason that there's a lot of security overhead in terms of costs and such, and a lot of regulatory controls is because, uh, well, Putting a lot of money in one place is never that great of an idea. Um, so who am I? Uh, my name is John Light. I've got a website, uh, lightco.in. Uh, that's my home on the web. Uh, I founded a meetup in San Francisco called Buttonwood SF, which is basically like a Satoshi Square for bit, uh, San Francisco, where people can meet up every week and trade Bitcoins face-to-face, -face, truly peer-to-peer. And uh, I have a podcast uh, that I publish on my website, p2pconnects.us. It's also on the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. If any of y'all are fans of Let's Talk Bitcoin, you can also download the podcast there. And uh, I do consulting for Bitcoin investors and businesses. Uh, i got a website, bitcoinconsultant.me. If you just do a web search for Bitcoin Consultant, you'll find it. Um, and... Probably the first thing to recognize about security is that it's a process. It's not a destination. You will never be secure. If you ever see a website or an app that says, we're secure, that's, I mean, it's just patently false. There's always, there's always a way. But they might be secure at that moment, at that time, but there will come a time when they need to adjust their security processes to account for new technology that's coming out, new exploits, new malware, et cetera. So security is a process that you always constantly have to be tweaking and updating uh, based on the threats that are out there. And um, probably a, a really good principle of security is that you know, good security is when the cost of an attack is more than the value of uh, what can be gained uh, by executing an attack. Now, this really is only a good principle of security against uh, people that are financially motivated. Um, some uh, large, uh, highly organized actors are not necessarily financially motivated, so uh, good security does not always protect against those attackers because they'll just throw unlimited resources at you just to hurt you. Um, but from, for common criminals, if you can make uh, a dollar cost a dollar and 10 cents to attack, then that dollar's not going anywhere. Um, and then as a, as a final uh, kind of, um, as a kind of final truism uh, that we're gonna use here, uh, in math we trust, uh, because math doesn't lie. People will try and tell you that two plus two doesn't equal four, but don't buy it. So one of the, one of the posts that was recently published by a journalist named Quinn Norton, I thought was really, um, really well written and really helps highlight just where we are as an industry in terms of uh, computer security. It's called Everything is Broken, and I recommend all of you read it because it will really help uh, kind of wake you up to like really uh, how insecure things really are. 
And just to provide some context for the discussion, um, you all might remember a, a little bug called Heartbleed. This was a bug in um, the OpenSSL library, which basically let people uh, ask servers for um, basically any information that the server had ever been told. So um, any anything that had, it, for people who were using uh, websites that were affected by the Heartbleed OpenSSL bug, it actually would have been better for their security if they hadn't used SSL at all at the time because people were able to find their usernames and passwords and uh, email addresses and all kinds of interesting information that had gone over SSL and, and been communicated to these servers. And then, uh, and then uh, the Heartbleed bug came out and uh, people realized that wasn't such a great idea. Um, so that, just, just for some context, like OpenSSL underpins this all of the security for the internet, pretty much. Um, it's, it's the main library that people use. And because everybody used it, everybody figured someone had to be looking at it, right? It's like someone's got to be checking this code to make sure that there's nothing silly that would reveal all of the passwords in it, right? Well, no. For like 10 years, it went un, un, undetected. And then, and then it hits. It's a zero day. You just one day, it's it's. The whole web is compromised. And we've recently seen another bug like that called the Bash bug or Shell Shock or um, one of these names, which basically affected like over half of the websites on the internet. Um, another another uh, interesting security uh, exploit that was this was like a this was like ten days ago, I think, um, and this is still an unfolding story. Uh, it was originally disclosed, I believe, at Black Hat earlier this year. But uh, USB, as a as a tool, uh, USB sticks have a fundamental security flaw that you can't detect. Uh, but it's in virtually every single USB stick, which uh, people can uh, basically uh, use a compromised USB stick to take over your computer and do anything as if they were sitting at your keyboard. Um, and this is something that you can't detect, so it's just um, the code is now on GitHub, so anybody can use this exploit. Um, so don't plug strange USB sticks into your computer, and uh, maybe even be cautious with the USB sticks you're already using. Um, this is uh, these are some more headlines. So so. That those exploits are like just fundamental exploits that were unintentional, and uh, there are also a lot of intentional exploits out there. So, um, Google, Yahoo, and Skype were targeted for man in the middle attacks by the government of Iran. They basically spoofed search certificates, SSL certificates for these websites, and were performing man in the middle attacks on people intentionally. This was this was a nation state actor. Um, and uh, there was also a certificate authority in the Netherlands, I believe, called DigiNotar, which was breached and um, uh, had a fraudulent certificate for Google.com issued. So people going to Google.com saw the little green lock, thought it was secure, but it wasn't. All of their information was going to an attacker. Um, even though it looked for all intents and purposes like it was uh, legitimately Google who was receiving the information. Uh, these are just some, some things you gotta keep in mind. Uh, the state of the internet is not good. Um, and <laughs> to, to make it even worse, you've got every single mobile phone, uh, smartphone, has uh, hidden operating systems that basically respond to any uh, commands that uh, uh, a cell tower uh, sends to it. It's a baseband, proprietary baseband processor. It's got like proprietary firmware in your devices. It's all backdoored. Um, the NSA has built uh, backdoor access into Windows uh, 8. All, I mean, this is like a story that goes back to the 90s. So I mean, it, you, you have to take this stuff into account uh, when you think like, am I secure? Um, secure is a relative term. Uh, <laughs> And, and there's uh, even cases where uh, corporations uh, collude directly with governments to spy on people. So uh, these are just some things to take into account. Uh, some ways that you can help mitigate 
some of these like fundamental risks before we even start talking about software, before we even start talking about Bitcoin. It's like, what kind of machines are you actually using to interface with this software? What, what, what kind of hardware are you running? Well, the, the, the best way to truly uh, you know, start with a good foundation of security is to know your hardware, and that means open source. So there's a lot of good open source platforms that you can use for basic Bitcoin operations. Uh, the most sensitive, secure Bitcoin operations generating and storing and signing messages with private keys. So uh, that device up in the top right corner there is a, I believe that's a Beagle Bone Black. And um, there, that is an open source hardware device that uh, is a, like about as powerful as a f maybe three or four year old laptop. So that's a really good platform for using to just uh, generate private keys and sign messages with an offline cold storage system, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, there's also fully open source hardware uh, laptops that are made of fully open source components um, that you can put together yourself so you know every single component that's going into your machine. Um, and there's a really interesting project um, called Project Aura that got picked up by Google not the most confidence-inspiring uh, company when it comes to protecting privacy, but nonetheless, this is an open-source hardware project uh, to create a modular phone where you can actually choose individually what components uh, you want to go into your phone, and that's that bottom right-hand image. Uh, you can, if you want a, a webcam, you can put a webcam module in there. If you want Wi-Fi, you can put Wi-Fi module. If you want private keys for signing Bitcoin transactions, you could probably make a module for that too. So these are, these are some uh, not cool ideas. Uh, if you want to start from a really uh, solid foundation for uh, your secure Bitcoin transactions, and then uh, once you have the hardware figured out, uh, you want to you wanna deal with a good, reputable, uh, well-supported open source software. So Linux is, of course, uh, a standard within the uh, security community. There are, of course, a lot of different distros that you can use for Linux. Um, Ubuntu, Mint um, are some of the more popular ones. There's also uh, like Gentoo and, and several others. You can just do your searching online to find one that you like, maybe try a few out to see how you like the interface. There's also Tails, which is a specifically a privacy and anonymous uh, focused uh, Linux distribution, which you can run as a live CD. So you can actually just uh, put it on a CD or on a USB stick, and you don't even need to actually install Linux on your computer. You just have to uh, put the CD in your CD drive or your USB stick and then turn your computer on and it'll automatically boot into this uh, kind of privacy, anonymous centric uh, Linux operating system. And all of the traffic that goes through the internet on this operating system is gonna be pushed through Tor unless it explicitly tells you like, hey, you're about to send like non-encrypted, non-Tor uh, internet traffic. It'll put a big warning. Um, and then for m mobile phones, um, of course, iOS is proprietary, so trust it at, it, it, you, you can trust iOS about as much as you trust Apple, and you can trust Apple about, a, about as much as you can trust anybody that can apply a strong amount of pressure on Apple to put backdoors in their platform. So uh, for Android, as I mentioned earlier, there are some proprietary uh, components in Android, even though most people think like, oh, Android open source. Well, you know, all of the factory Android phones come with a lot of proprietary stuff in them. So if you want to start from scratch with a truly open source platform, there is an uh, Android uh, distro called a Replicant, which you can check out online. Uh, it's not supported by every single phone, but they try to get all of the all of the most popular phones, and uh, Cyanogen Mod is, a, is also a pretty good uh, choice uh, if you want to use a um, something that's not factory Android. And when it comes to like your web browsing, um, Firefox 
I would say is probably the best browser that you could use. Um, it's a very extensible and open source, and they have a great community. So the first piece of software that I, I, I think is important to go over uh, when it comes to protecting Bitcoin security is GNUPG. Uh, this is an uh, this program uses asymmetric or public key cryptography, and uh, public key cryptography is actually the, the technology that underlies uh, most of the Bitcoin security. Like you have a you have a public key which is used to derive your Bitcoin address that people send money to, and then you use your private key to sign messages. GNUPG works a lot the same way, except it's it's for general uh, communications. So you can actually encrypt uh, like emails or text documents on your computer, and then uh, send them to people, and then they can decrypt them with private keys. Uh, the the importance of this software w in the context of Bitcoin is like if you want to uh, have a friend pay you uh, for something, then uh, if you don't want to expose your Bitcoin address to uh, your email service provider or uh, anybody who could get into your email account, uh, you would just send it to them encrypted. And then they'll be able to decrypt it locally and send you Bitcoins. So um, that's, that's really a lot what it's good for. You can also use it for um, encrypting multi-signature transaction data or uh, offline storage transaction data if you want to be like super paranoid. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Another good piece of software is called TrueCrypt. Uh, now TrueCrypt had uh, some interesting drama uh, happen around it earlier this year where the development team which no one actually knew who that was to begin with, uh, put some cryptic messages up on their website and said that the software was insecure and people shouldn't download it. And, um, and you can read the whole backstory on that online if you just Google TrueCrypt. I'm sure it'll come up. Um, please don't Google it. You start page. Um, or DuckDuckGo, something like that. One of the not spy search engines. Um, but. Nonetheless, people have picked up the TrueCrypt project and are continuing to support that. So find, you can find a, a working TrueCrypt out there on the internet. And this software will allow you to create encrypted containers that you can drop files into. And it'll also allow you to encrypt full drives. So you, uh, you can do full disk encryption on your computer if your computer doesn't support it. Uh, full disk encryption already, Mac support, full disk encryption, Linux, most Linux distros support full disk encryption. So if you have a Windows computer, you can use TrueCrypt for full disk encryption. Um, but it's Windows, so just you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, and, and one of the really cool things that TrueCrypt does is it allows you to create uh, hidden volumes. <laughs> so you can actually encrypt these uh, file containers with two passwords. One of the passwords opens one volume, and the other password opens another volume. So in one volume, you could put like sensitive-looking files that aren't actually that sensitive. And then if someone tries to coerce you into opening the container, you give them that password, and they see all of your sensitive-looking files, but not actually what they want to get at. And you have plausible deniability that the, as to whether or not the actual hidden volume exists because they can't really detect it unless, um, unless they're really, really trying to get at it. And even then, you have plausible deniability. When you want to get at your actually sensitive files, you just put in the password for that volume, and it'll unencrypt that. So the purpose of TrueCrypt is in the context of Bitcoin would be for like storing your wallet.dat files. Um, your wallet.dat file is probably the most sensitive file you'll ever have on your computer. Um, and that controls, that stores the private keys that allow your money to be spent. So you can drop your wallet.dat file into a TrueCrypt container and 
protect it with a couple passwords, and then uh, you know you'll have plausible deniability if anyone ever tries to rob you. And uh, otherwise, if you get a virus on your computer and it tries to take the uh, wallet.dat file, well, it's encrypted, so they won't be able to get at it. So this is this is pretty good software. Um, one of the things that, that Will mentioned in the last presentation was password managers. Of course, uh, in the modern internet life, uh, we have so many accounts, so many usernames, so many passwords. Uh, you just want to throw your hands up in the air and uh, just uh, run away from all of it. But we can't because we live in the 21st century and uh, have to deal with modern society. So uh, the only option really is to uh, either use you know just a few passwords and and hope that works out okay because none of the services get uh, hacked, or you have to use a good password on all of your accounts, and that can get really unwieldy if you have a bad memory or even an average memory. So um, password managers help you uh, bridge that gap by allowing you to only have to remember one good password. And then you can store all of your other passwords and usernames and accounts in the password manager. And really, um, when you use a pass man password manager, it says you only have to remember one password. But really, you want to remember three. All right, Three passwords for the rest of your life. One for your full disk encryption on your machine, one for your password manager, and one for the USB stick that's not compromised, uh, which is going to store uh, your uh, key file, which you can use for like two-factor authentication with your um, password manager. So your password manager will allow you to have a password and then a key file so that you need the key file and the password. That's basic, key file is basically any file that's on your computer. It could be a picture, it could be a song, but it's like something that's special to you that you use as like a second thing that someone needs to know in order to get into the password manager. And you're gonna encrypt that file in a USB stick that's not compromised with a third password. So one password for your full disk encryption, which you use to encrypt your whole machine, one password for the password manager, and one password for a USB stick. Those, those are the only passwords you should ever need to know. And um, there's a lot of advice out there for how to pick good passwords, but the, the general, the gist of it is that you want it to be something that's easy for you to remember, but hard for somebody else or a machine, uh, most importantly, to guess. Um, you know, a lot of people think that this is like a lot of random characters and numbers and you know, special special characters, and it doesn't have to be like that. It can be, uh, it can be, like a line of poetry, with like your birth date, and then like a line from your favorite movie, and those three things put together are really hard to guess. Individually, they might be easy to guess, but all together, it's like really hard to guess. So. You can use a formula kind of like that to uh, to come up with some passwords if you want. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that logo is KeePass. KeePass X is a good cross-platform open-source password manager. They have uh, mobile apps and and apps for all of the major operating systems. So yes, K E E. P A S S X, key pass X. Great question. I don't know too much about LastPass. I believe they store your passwords in the cloud, and that's just kind of weird to me, so I'm not sure. Is that a no? What's that? It's cl client side? Okay. Look into LastPass uh, then and pick whatever works best for you. What's up? Yeah. Mm hmm Okay. So he's he's saying that uh Norton 
uh, Norton Antivirus. They, they offer a lot of uh, security suite, uh, Norton 360, and they have a password manager. Um, it's proprietary, so take that for what you will. It basically means that you need to trust Norton uh, with you know the, the source code. Um, I don't believe they've opened the source code uh, for their products for review. Um, they do own uh, PGP now, and PGP is open source, but it is but they own it. Uh, but I do not believe they've open sourced their password manager. So if you trust Norton, then you can trust their password manager, just like you can trust Apple, right? Uh, and I prefer I personally prefer open source. So um, take that for what you will. Great question. Um, and then uh, and then if and then similar to you know using PGP to communicate addresses and other kinds of maybe sensitive information to other people, uh, there's some open source uh, encrypted IM and chat clients that you can use. Uh, Pigeon and OTR is a free um, open source uh, XMPP chat program. It's cross-platform. CryptoCat is a browser extension that's really easy to use for encrypted instant messaging. And ChatSecure is a mobile application that's like Pigeon. It works over the XMPP protocol, which was up until recently supported by like Facebook and Google. Uh, but I think they're closing down and, and discontinuing support for XMPP. But it still works with Jabber and other popular chat platforms. And you would just use these programs to like com communicate addresses or transaction information that you don't want exposed to the clear net. <laughs> and uh, for similar reasons, if you want to communicate th that kind of information over the telephone, you can use Redphone, which is end-to-end -end encrypted. It uses ZRTP encryption. Uh, that's um, basically uh, it, it, when you call somebody, it'll show two words on your screen. If those two words match on both ends of the call, then there's no man in the middle, and it's a completely private call between two parties. Basically, the person who picks up the call says the first word. The person who actually made the call says the second word. If they both match, then it's good. If not, you should hang up and maybe book the next flight out of the country. Yeah. I don't know what you're referencing. Kind of like that. Yeah, like basically it shows two words. So like hat apple, when the person picks up, they say hat. And you say apple. And you look at your screen and it says hat apple. And you're like, yeah. Yeah, the voice is encrypted. You want to say it before you say anything sensitive, because if there is a man in the middle, then it could be at any time in the call. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, good question. You're saying the words for yourself and for the other person. The software doesn't know whether you're actually saying the words. It's just there for you and for your own benefit and for you to double check to see whether or not the call is being listened in on. Does that make sense? Yes. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. No, yeah, so so it's secure from the moment you make the phone call if the two words match. So it's best, like, before the person even says hello to you, they say the first word on the screen, you say the second word, and then if they match, then you can proceed with the call. Otherwise, you know right away, like, the words don't match, and so you should, like, like I said, like, hang up and figure out what's... It changes for every call, correct. Nope, nope.
Well, there's two words, and both of you can see both words, but if, but you, you each only say one of the words, because if one of you says both of the words, well, the other person could lie and say, oh yeah, I see, I see those words too, but really, they don't see those words, and Yeah, no, 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 no. It's, it's just, it's just like a, it's just a security mechanism that you use for your own benefit. It's right, exactly. I would, I mean, so real time uh, voice, uh, like voice um, copying. I guess would be kind of difficult. I don't know. You know, like if it, like a man in the middle would have to basically dub the sound of your voice to make it sound like you're saying something that you're not. So it's, it's. Yeah, I mean, I look at like, uh, you know, if, if you recognize the person's voice on the other end of the call, they say one word, you say another word, and they both match. Like, there's no way for the person on the other end of the call to know what's on your screen and vice versa. So if it, match, if, if it matches, then th it's really hard to fake that. Um, but... Well, I think that the, the, the point of the words is that if the words don't match, then um, you do have a man in the middle. Like, it's, it's deterministic. It's cryptographically certain that there's a man in the middle. And if the words match, then it's cryptographically certain that there's not a man in the middle. I think that's, that's how it works. It's like matching fingerprints. Yeah, so this, is, this, is, this, phone, this app is called Red Phone. Sorry if I didn't mention that. Red Phone. It's developed by Open Whisper Systems. Uh, if you just do a web search for uh, Red Phone, and then uh, if you're on iOS, like if you have uh, you know, an iPhone, it's called Signal. And Signal is compatible with Red Phone. Eventually, they're going to roll it all into one big Signal app. Um, but yeah. And the same company, Open Whisper Systems, develops uh, an app that basically does the same thing, but for text messages. It's called Text Secure. Signal uh, for iOS does the calls and the texting, and they are Signal is compatible with Red Phone and Text Secure. It does end-to-end -end encrypted uh, text messaging, so you can send, you know, encrypted uh, text messages to your friends and family, and you can confirm that there's no man in the middle by. Uh, verifying the fingerprints of the keys that are being used uh, out of band, so like in a phone call or in person. Um, and it, 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 in addition to actually encrypting the text over the air, it also encrypts your text message database locally. So if, if anyone ever takes your phone, um, you, can, you, know, you can lock the database. Uh, or if your phone turns off, the database locks, and they won't be able to actually get into your text messages. So uh, that's useful, again, for sending uh, sensitive Bitcoin transaction data to other people. Um, so another service uh, that's really useful for uh, protecting uh, your privacy, at least when you're using Bitcoin, is Tor. Uh, most uh, Bitcoin clients support Tor in some way. Uh, there are instructions online for how to configure your clients to uh, push traffic through Tor. Um, for ex instance, uh, the Mycelium app that you were instructed to download earlier lets you uh, port forward to local host 9050, port 9050, which is basically your Android's um, uh, Tor setting, so you can put Orbot on your phone and uh, configure your Bitcoin wallet to go through Tor again. Instructions for that are online if you want that. And basically the purpose of this is to obscure where your transactions are being broadcast from. So your IP address will never actually show up on the Bitcoin network. Uh, so uh, 
the last point here, it says that Tor is not a silver bullet, and that basically means that even though the general principle is uh, online anonymity, understand that there are a lot of uh, ways that this anonymity can be compromised, particularly by a, uh, a, a nation state size actor who has a very broad overview of the network. Basically, the network is uh, vulnerable to Sybil attacks, which basically means that one person sets up a ton of nodes in the network that monitors everything that's going on, and then they correlate the data that they see on their Tor nodes with data that they're seeing on the regular internet, and they say, oh, this person went in through the clear net on this side, and then there was some traffic on the website over here right after that. This is probably the same person. Again, it takes like a nation state size actor to do something like that, but those are the generally the people that like, you know, you're really worried about, right? So um, Tor is not a silver bullet, but it, it's a great first start. Um, another thing that you can use in conjunction with Tor is like a VPN software. And there's a lot of different VPN services out there, uh, but the criteria that you're gonna, gonna wanna look for to determine like what VPN you wanna use, um, you wanna choose one that uses multi-hop instead of single hops so that uh, your servers uh, keep changing and your IP address is dynamic and, and, and you don't have just one server that's taking the brunt of the traffic. It's, it's kind of spread out. So there are a lot of VPN services you can look for. Uh, you want to ask, do they accept private forms of payment? If you have to pay with a credit card, well, it kind of defeats the purpose of like you know staying private and anonymous, right? So do they accept Bitcoin? That's a pretty good start. Um, also, some of them accept cash. It's kind of weird to send cash in the mail to an anonymous website, but hey, if they've got a reputation, it works. Um, another question to ask is, do they store logs? Uh, most VPNs do not, simply because they don't have the resources. Like, if they stored logs for every single user of every single website, every IP address that ever went through their servers, wow, that's a lot of memory. They are not like the NSA with a Bluffdale uh, NSA security center with, you know, zettabytes or whatever full of uh, servers uh, that they can store all their stuff in. So most of them dump their logs, uh, but you want to make sure that they advertise that they do this because uh, then if they don't, then it's like fraud. So uh, you can do a search online to find the best, most reputable VPNs. Maybe try a few different ones. They usually let you do a free trial, find the one that works best for you and bonus points if they have a mobile application so that you can use it on your phone. Question. Well, um, one, well, like I just said, uh, if, they, if they do store logs, then it would be like false advertising, and that's kind of like a criminal offense. But say like they're coerced into storing logs, well then there's not a lot, whole lot that you can do. Um, but what you can do is you can use VPNs in conjunction with Tor, and then, you, and then you're like doubly protected. So um, some, some VPN services let you choose what servers you want to connect to. So if you want to be like super careful, you just like change what servers you connect to each time you connect to the VPN, and then you're kind of a moving target. Um, and... Um, Another thing is, as I mentioned, some in, in most cases, it's just unfeasible. Like there's just so much data going through their, their cert, they can't log it. They, they, it would be uneconomical for them to log it. So they just, it's all passed through. They just delete everything as it comes through. Uh, VPN inside of Tor, yeah. So it's like you connect to the VPN and then the connection goes through Tor. So that way the entry node, the Tor entry node, doesn't even know what your IP address is. And we get to Bitcoin. <laughs> Thank you for uh, sitting through that. It was, it was, it's, it's valuable to provide some context, like I said, because if you don't start off with a solid foundation, 
then uh, you know if you're downloading a Bitcoin client on your virus-ridden Windows uh, XP computer, then you're you're already you're already done for. So it's good to start with a pretty solid foundation. I think I covered the basics. If if anyone has any comments or question, please feel free to jump in. Otherwise, we're gonna. Uh, dive right into this here. So, of course, Bitcoin is a pseudonymous peer-to-peer -peer irreversible payment network, and that uh, that entails a high degree of security because if your money leaves your wallet, it's probably not coming back. Um, so, a uh, first uh, basic piece of advice is to encrypt your wallet. Most wallets, uh, especially the uh, Bitcoin Core reference client, offers encryption natively, uh, do be aware that if you have a keylogger or some other kind of virus on your computer, even encrypting your wallet will not protect you because as soon as you put in your password to decrypt your wallet, the attacker uh, will know your password and be able to take your funds. So that's why we're going to get into offline cold storage and we'll talk about that in a minute. Another piece of advice is to use two-factor authentication on all of your accounts. Will went over this. Uh, several times. Lee mentioned it as well. Um, it's just generally good practice for all of your online accounts that offer two-factor authentication to use it because you never know which of your accounts will be used as a vector to attack you in some way. So uh, most of the major social networking websites offer it. Uh, most of the major email providers offer this. Uh, pretty much any service that is, is it's dealing with sensitive data in any way offers this, online banking and the like. Cloud storage offers it. Yes, most services offer this. Um, do recognize that two-factor authentication uh, does not protect you against an internal attacker. Uh, so, of course, the service can offer, <laughs> the service giveth two-factor authentication, the service can take it away. Um, if somebody gets into their servers, they can just like disable 2FA from the back end and mess with your accounts. So when it comes to Bitcoin, excuse me, when it comes to Bitcoin, it's really just best to deal with uh, like client side services like blockchain.info because even if 2FA is uh, compromised, you still have some degree of protection. Um, another thing that's important about security, aside from just like making it hard for attackers to get at your money, is to actually protect your personal information and your transaction information uh, as a matter of operational security. So like encrypting your information in 2FA and all of that, that's information security. That's how to actually keep the information that's on your computer secure. A uh, privacy aspect of Bitcoin is part of operational security. So like you wanna make sure that People aren't like tracking how much money you spend and then, you know, saying like, oh, well, you know, this guy gets paid on this day. And so maybe that's a good day to, uh, you know, go and uh, ask him uh, for his milk money. Um, and uh, so you, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, ways that you can kind of anonymize your Bitcoin transactions in the blockchain in order to uh, protect your financial privacy. Um, and the last piece of advice, which unfortunately too many people in the Bitcoin community were never told or just simply ignored, don't give Bitcoins to strangers. Uh, that'll save you a lot of heartache. Um, and with that in mind, let's, let's uh, yeah. So the part about giving Bitcoins to strangers is less about like revealing something on your end and more about just like worrying about whether you're going to get the Bitcoins back in the future. Um, if you're worried about showing the transaction balance uh, of the address that you're sending the Bitcoins from, you can use a mixer to disconnect the, the sending address from the receiving address. But the point about uh, don't sending, uh, not sending uh, Bitcoins to strangers is just the fact that oftentimes when people do this, they don't get their Bitcoins back. And that's, that's never any fun, so. Yeah, yeah, like especially if their name is Pirate at 40. Um, and, oh. 
that that you know he 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 had a bounty ball like he was like really like friendly looking I don't know he, he was God bless Mark Carpellis. All right, so oh, unfortunately it got a little cut off, but cold storage is the gold standard of Bitcoin security. Um, cold storage means that your private keys are kept on an offline computer. The ideal situation is when this computer has A, never touched the internet, and B, will never touch the internet again. As soon as a computer touches the internet, consider it possibly compromised. I mean, it's, if you want absolute certainty, those are the conditions that must be met. It must have never touched the internet, and it must never touch the internet. Um, so I mentioned earlier the Beagle Bone Black. Uh, there's another device called the Raspberry Pi. These are very cheap devices. The Beagle Bones you can get for like $60, $70 online. Raspberry Pis are about half that price. They're very lightweight uh, computers, so they can't do really anything heavier than like word processing and maybe some light coding and uh, and maybe internet browsing if, if you're not looking at like super JavaScript heavy websites or anything like that. But these are these are great devices for just generating private keys and signing transactions. So you can buy one of the Raspberry Pis for like 30 bucks and then um, uh, install uh, some Bitcoin software on there, generate your private keys, and then uh, bring transactions from your online hot computer over to the cold computer using a non-compromised USB stick, preferably a USB stick that has a lock on it so that it can go to read-only mode. And, and then uh, you can sign the transaction on your cold computer, bring the transaction back to the hot computer, and then broadcast it to the network. And um, the last thing you're going to want is a dumb computer, like a, like the dumb, or excuse me, a dumb printer, like the dumbest printer that you can find, the oldest, dumbest computer that still works. Because all of the computers nowadays, or excuse me, all the printers nowadays, they're like really smart, uh, as in they like store all of the things that you've ever printed on them, and if you're printing out private keys, that's not a feature, that's a bug. Uh, if you're really printing out anything that's like sensitive, uh, that's, that's not good. So, um, just a summary, you, you're gonna want, for, for cold storage, if you really wanna do this right, you're gonna want two computers, one cold computer that you use for generating your private keys and signing transactions, one hot computer that you use for transaction broadcasting. This can be your regular everyday computer. And uh, you want a USB stick with a read-write lock. And we're gonna talk about why in a minute. Um, and this is what you use to actually transfer transaction data between the two computers. And you want a dumb printer for printing out your paper wallets and backups. Yes. I will be happy to post them. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can get them to the Coins in the Kingdom people, and I will definitely post them on my website. So uh, bitcoinconsultant.me, I'll post it there, and I'll remind you at the end, too. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, and then uh, one uh, interesting uh, advancement in the past like couple years has been the advent of hardware wallets. So these are hardware devices that are specifically designed and created for generating, storing private keys and signing transactions. Um, so Bitcoin Armory is a software that uh, I recommend to everybody for uh, offline uh, cold signing. Uh, it's a very feature-rich software, uh, uh, one thing that I would like to, uh, one caveat I would like to say is that if you're gonna run Armory on your online computer, you want it to be a pretty powerful computer, so like at least eight gigs of RAM. Um, because, and and uh, it, it builds the whole blockchain, so to, to give you maximum security, so you know that you're, you're dealing with the real blockchain, and it's uh, broadcasting transactions properly. So you're gonna need probably around 
maybe at least uh, 100 gigabytes of, of free space on your computer so that it can build the databases properly. So 100 gigabytes uh, of hard drive space, 8 gigs of RAM, and you will have the most secure Bitcoin setup possible. Um, what you do is you install Bitcoin Armory on both your online computer and your offline computer. Um, you generate a wallet on your offline computer, uh, create a watching only copy that you put on your USB stick, you turn the USB stick into read only mode, send it over to the online computer, upload your watching only copy of the wallet to your full version of Bitcoin Armory that's on your online computer. And at that point, the two wallets are synchronized. So any addresses that you generate on your offline computer or on your online computer will be compatible with the other wallet. They're like synchronized, even though they're on different computers. And then what you can do is you can create new transactions on the online uh, Bitcoin Armory wallet export those transactions to the USB stick, bring it back to the offline computer, sign the transactions in your offline version of Bitcoin Armory, and then bring the signed transaction back to the online computer for broadcasting to the Bitcoin network. Once you have it set up, you can do this whole process in like less than five minutes, and it is the most secure setup. Keep in mind that this is not for like everyday spending. You don't have to do this for every single Bitcoin transaction. This is for like your life savings that you're putting into Bitcoins. And um, you should only have to do this like every once in a while, like maybe once a month if you want to transfer Bitcoins from your cold storage into your hot wallet that you actually use for daily transactions. Uh, the, that device up in the top right corner is the Trezor. That is uh, probably the, uh, the most popular uh, hardware device. It was crowdfunded last year, and it just uh, began shipping recently. There have been a lot of good reviews about it, so um, definitely check that out. It is probably... What's that? Endorsement from Will. Trezor is awesome. You heard it here, folks. Trezor? Yes. So Trezor would be like a replacement for all of that, all of those steps that I just told you. Trezor kind of replaces that. Um, and uh, it basically, it generates the key on the device and then you use it in conjunction with some software that they give you and it, it, it'll give you a pin and you just put your pin in every time you want to make a transaction and then the device will sign the transaction send it back to your computer and it'll broadcast it to the internet and the private keys are totally air gapped from the internet and are it, at that point you only really have to worry about physical security of the device just don't lose the device if you lose the device you lose your private keys sir t r e z o r trezor and uh, this uh, fine example at the bottom is uh, one of the many uh, Bitcoin paper wallet designs that are available. What I like to do is to um, basically uh, take one of those uh, Tails live uh, CDs that I was describing earlier, uh, pop it in uh, my computer, go on to uh, pull up the web browser, go to like bitaddress.org, over HTTPS, I make sure you know it's it's uh, authenticated and everything, and then turn the internet off, and then the you can still use the website while the internet is off because it's running directly in your browser. You can generate as many of these paper wallets as you want. I'll print out like 20 at a time, like 20 uh, different paper wallets at a time, and uh, use one, uh, rip it up use one again, rip it up, use one again, rip it up, and uh, you can do this uh, as many times as you want, really. Um, if, but if you don't want to kill trees, just use Trezor or use recycled paper. And uh, the last, uh, so, so cold storage is like the gold standard, but recently uh, people, uh, multi-sig has been uh, uh, really popular with uh, Bitcoin wallets, and for good reason. Multi-sig basically offers you two-factor authentication on the blockchain. 
So uh, multi-signature transactions mean that you need not one key to sign your transaction. You need M of N keys. And M and N can be any variables. For example, two of two, three of five, two of three, nine of 10. And, I mean, Bitcoin protocol is very extensible, supports a lot of different, but you don't want to get too unwieldy. So like five of five is probably the most you'll ever need. Uh, Bitcoin Armory, I believe, supports up to seven of seven. I could be wrong about that, but it, 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 it supports a wide variety. And you can use these for, uh, uh, you can imagine a number of different use cases. One popular example is like corporate treasury. You'll have like all of the executives in a corporation uh, as signers on a multi-signature transaction so that no one executive can abscond with the f uh, corporate funds. Uh, it's also a way to do quote unquote trustless escrow where you don't actually have to trust the escrow provider to not run away with your money um, as long as you can trust that they won't collude with the person that you're doing business with. So uh, if you've got a merchant and an escrow provider, uh, you, you create a multi-signature transaction, two of three uh, between yourself, the merchant, and the escrow provider. Uh, if the transaction goes awry, then you go to the escrow provider and you say, hey, I didn't get my stuff or, or it's broken and they're not responding. And then they will sign the transaction, you will sign the transaction, you will get your money back. If nothing goes wrong, then you sign the transaction, the merchant signs the transaction, the, comp the payment completes and everything's, everything goes all right and the escrow provider doesn't even need to get involved. Um, and so uh, another way that people use this is for like, like I said, blockchain-based two-factor authentication where you'll have a two-of-two two transaction where one key is on your mobile phone and one key is on your actual desktop or laptop computer. And then when you initiate a transaction on either of those devices, you also need to sign the transaction on your other device. And the only way that the Bitcoins can be hacked is if somebody has the keys that are on both devices. It, it decreases... Uh, your odds of getting hacked, since you might have one device that's compromised, but the odds of both devices being compromised are lower. So uh, this is good for uh, security for hot wallets. So that that problem I mentioned earlier, where like if you encrypt your wallet, if you have a keylogger, it doesn't really mean much because as soon as you decrypt it, the keylogger gets your password and can spend your bitcoins. Well, even if you have a keylogger on your computer. Um, as long as your other device that's storing your private, your second private key for your two of two uh, wallet isn't compromised, uh, then you know even if your uh, main computer has a virus or, or, or key loggers or whatever, your bitcoins are still safe. So uh, multi-sig is a really great tool. Um, like I said, Bitcoin Armory supports it. Several other wallets do as well. You can look that up online if you want to learn more about that. Uh, so. Uh, uh, f too long, didn't listen. Um, store long-term savings, wallet, private keys offline. Uh, you, you can use uh, Bitcoin Armory for this. The Bitcoin Armory website has all of the instructions um, for doing that on their website. They have a slideshow presentation that walks you through it very nicely. Uh, you can encrypt uh, your wallet files and machines whenever possible. Uh, even you know the offline computer, like I said, I recommend full disk encryption at all times. That way, if your uh, computer ever gets out of your physical control, uh, you can feel uh, you can rest assured that uh, you know the data that's in the computer hasn't been compromised. Um, most mobile wallets allow you to set a PIN number. I know my Celium does. Uh, uh, just that's a really good thing to do, just as a basic security precaution. Um, <clears throat> install good antivirus software and keep it up to date. Uh, same with all of your other software. Uh, you want to keep all of your software up to date. Um, don't click on random links from strangers or even friends because uh, your friends might be hacked and they'll send you a link that's like, uh, you know, enlarge your thing for like, you know, five ninety five, and you're like, no. Um, so don't click on any random links and don't download any strange attachments. Um, uh, another good uh, protection uh, when you're browsing the web is to install NoScript, uh, the NoScript plugin, and HTTPS everywhere. So what NoScript does is it makes it so that every time you visit a new website, if it's got JavaScript running on the website, it blocks it. 
and it makes you have to allow it uh, to like whitelist the JavaScript that's running on that website. Uh, one of the things that common, it's all too common in the Bitcoin world, unfortunately, is someone will have their Bitcoin wallet open in one browser window, and then they'll be browsing somewhere else and click on a link, and it'll take them to a website, and some JavaScript will run that ends up doing a cross-scripting attack, and it'll go to their other browser window and steal their Bitcoins. You can stop that from happening by uh, running uh, no script, and that way if you click on any errant uh, links, uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to worry about that JavaScript stealing your Bitcoins. HTTPS everywhere basically uh, forces websites, if they have HTTPS, it forces them to serve you uh, an HTTPS connection, so all of your uh, communications will be encrypted with that website. Did I see a hand back there? Ghostery, that's another good one. Um, uh, so Ghostery will basically tell you all of the different uh, scripts and uh, trackers and, and things like that that are running on the websites that you're looking at, and you can actually turn them off, uh, and then also whitelist ones that you don't mind uh, sh running in your browser. Yeah. Any virus software, that's a good question. Um, so I'm most familiar with Symantec products. Um, I've never had a problem with Symantec, and I've, I mean, you know, knock on wood, but like I haven't had a virus in, uh, in like since I was a kid when I was you know, clicking on random things. So um, it seems to work out fine, Symantec products. Um, but there are also open source products out there that work perfectly fine as well. Um, uh, so again, you know, do your research, see what the reviews online say, and uh, maybe try a couple out. And not at the same time, because sometimes they like conflict with each other, but you know, s see what works best for you, and then decide what you want. But Symantec is what I would say. Um, and last but certainly not least, use two-factor authentication. <laughs> Please, all your accounts, whenever possible. So further reading, securing your Bitcoins by, well, me. Um, that's on my website, bitcoinconsultant.me. I also published it on Let's Talk Bitcoin. Um, and I go over this in word form, so you don't have to try and memorize everything that I'm trying to say. And uh, there's even some more information in there that we haven't covered. Um, so we're going to talk about Bitcoin privacy for the last little bit. Um, the status, dismal. Um, <laughs> Bitcoin privacy is terrible. Uh, so Christoph Atlas, a security researcher, researcher in uh, uh, Bitcoin, interested, who's interested in cryptocurrencies, he's got a great show called Dark News, I recommend you check it out. Um, he posted a security advisory about the blockchain.info shared send service, uh, saying uh, basically the, the gist is that uh, it wasn't actually providing very much anonymity or privacy. Um, with, with a tool that he developed, he was able to uh, determine what inputs corresponded with what outputs and, and link addresses together. So that's, that's no good. I do not know if they have taken steps to fix this yet. Um, but uh, last I heard, it's, it's still not totally private. Hand? Okay. Um, and, and, and this, this uh, goes back to a story that Andy Greenberg from Forbes published last year called uh, Follow the Bitcoins, How We Got Busted Buying Drugs on Silk Road's Black Market. Basically, some, some researchers uh, uh, saw his story about you know, how he tried buying drugs on, on the Silk Road and actually found his Bitcoins, uh, found the transaction and followed it all the way through the blockchain from his wallet to Silk Road servers and then off to God knows where the Bitcoins ended up. But the long, uh, long story short, they found the Bitcoins, and that's, that's kind of interesting. So why is privacy with Bitcoin? Oh, yeah. Dark news. It's on the World Crypto Network. Shouts out to Tom. Mad Bitcoins. Mad Bitcoins. All right. Um, so why is privacy important? Um, cause you know, if you don't, if you haven't done anything wrong, you got nothing to hide, right? I mean, like, 
No one has anything to hide here, right? Um, no, it, it, that's, that's great, except uh, do you want your coworkers to know what your salary is? Do you want your lover to know about your recent large jewelry store purchase? Do you want your cashier to know your account balance? And do you want corporations or governments to know what activist causes you donate to? If any of these are a concern to you, you're a criminal. I mean, you're perfectly legitimate in wanting uh, privacy with your Bitcoin transactions, and you have every reason to want to protect that, and uh, no uh, politician has any right to say otherwise. Um, so some works in progress to protect Bitcoin privacy. Dark Wallet is a really good start. Uh, it uses CoinJoin as implemented, as described by Greg Maxwell. I don't know uh, whether or not it has the same flaws as uh, blockchain.info's shared coin service, uh, but one of the things that, one of the quote unquote flaws that it might have is the fact that it uses a central server um, to coordinate transactions for the, for the join. So I, I don't know the, completely myself the, the security model of their coin join implementation. Um, they, they also implement stealth addresses which basically allow you to post a static address somewhere, and then people can derive new addresses from the stealth address every time they want to send you bitcoins, which basically protects people so like uh, from like looking at all of the transactions that are being sent to the stealth address. Because typically, if you just put a static address on your website, people can take that static address, stick it in blockchain.info, and see every single transaction that's ever occurred with that address. But with a stealth address, uh, you can't stick a stealth address in blockchain.info. It it, it's not a real address. It doesn't tell you anything. Um, so it, it helps protect your privacy if you want to like accept tips on your website or something like that. Uh, Dark Wallet also has encrypted messaging in it. So it solves that problem I was talking about earlier. If you want to communicate like sensitive transaction data with other people, uh, you can you can just use the encrypted messaging that's built into Dark Wallet. Um, and then there's another project called Coin Shuffle, which is trying to work on solving some of the problems that uh, I just mentioned about uh, you know Coin Join or, or particularly Blockchain.info's uh, shared coin implementation. Uh, basically, it uses peer-to-peer -peer mixing, so there's no server that you need to trust which could possibly store logs that could be used to de-anonymize you. And uh, it also uses a Tor-like data encryption in order to uh, prevent uh, nodes that are relaying these transactions for the join from actually like seeing uh, you know, the destination address and where they're coming from. So Coin Shuffle is a really interesting project. But again, it's a work in progress. Um, yeah. They're both they're both in alpha, so they're both like you know kind of kind of far away from being done. Dark Wallet says that they're coming out with uh, I think a 1.0 by the end of the year. Um, Coin Shuffle, I know people who have developed an alpha implementation of Coin Shuffle. They'll probably have a beta that works. You know, it's not going to be the best interface, but it'll work uh, also by the end of the year. So I would say they're about neck and neck right now. Yeah. Under yeah. Un When they are done, that is uh, what they advertise. Uh, of course, there's going to need to be uh, reviews and testing to make sure that that is that uh, you know the, that what they're selling is is actually what you get. Um, but yeah, that's what they that's what they advertise is that you know eventually, when the services are done, you will be able to send uh, bitcoins to people and that transaction will be more or less untraceable in the blockchain. I wouldn't say, I mean, there might be a loud minority that, that maybe wants to 
suppress some of those features. But for all of the reasons that I described earlier, it's a fairly mainstream concern. Like you don't want all of your transactions being public. You know, it's just it's it's a common human decency to like not pry into people's personal lives like that. So, question. Um, yeah, so it doesn't protect you against like sending bitcoins to somebody and never getting them back, but it does protect you. Uh, or the question was like, does this does this protect you? Like, if you want to contribute, say, to a crowdfunding campaign, and you don't want everybody to know that you've crowd like sent money to this crowdfunding campaign, that's what it'll protect you against. What it won't protect you against is like if the crowdfunding campaign never sends you anything and doesn't send you your bitcoins back, then I mean that's something that is something that multi-sig escrow would help prevent uh, because then you would have a third signature that says, oh you didn't get your thing that you ordered from the crowdfunding campaign, we'll send you a refund. Um, and so does that answer your question? Awesome. So how so how do you how do you actually get private uh, Bitcoin transactions then if if the only commercial tool that people typically use ShareCoin doesn't work What can you do? Well, you can trust like Bitcoin laundry services like Bitcoin fog where you basically send bitcoins to a Bitcoin address that somebody controls and then they send the, the same amount of bitcoins minus a you know, small service fee uh, from a completely different address to to some other address uh, usually at a later time so that it's that much harder to disconnect. Well, in that case, you have to trust that service to not just like keep your Bitcoins. And usually these services are operated anonymously, so you don't even know who's running them because, I mean, if they, if they put their name out there, well, then they're a target, right? Um, at least so the story goes. Uh, but but it's, it's not unusual for, like I said, when you send Bitcoins to strangers, particularly anonymous strangers, you don't see them back. So how do you actually do this? like somewhat securely where you have some reasonable expectation that you're, you're, you're going to get your coins back. Well, you combine Tor with uh, all of these other services, coins, uh, to basically send your Bitcoins. Uh, this, is how, this is how we're going to do it here. Okay, so first you create and run li a Tails live CD. Uh, then you uh, boot up your, your anonymous browser and you go create a new pseudonymous new pseudonymous email accounts that are not attached to your real identity in any, any way. Then you take these email accounts and you use them to sign up with exchanges that don't ask you for any sort of personal information. These exchanges are typically altcoin only exchanges. Use ones that have been around for a while uh, and actually have some reputation. Um, but yeah, altcoin only exchanges typically don't ask you for any of your personal identity information. Send bitcoins to the exchange through a mixer because if you send them without sending them through like, you, you know, you shared coin. Yes, it's like kind of weak, um, but, but it's better than nothing. So use the shared coin to send bitcoins to the exchange. Uh, buy and withdraw altcoins. Um, so, uh, you know, send the altcoins to your local altcoin wallet. Then sign up for another exchange with another email address, send the altcoins to that exchange, buy some bitcoins with the altcoins, withdraw the bitcoins to your a new bitcoin wallet, and then mix the coins again, and then you'll be anonymous. Uh, bonus points if the uh, coin is one of these like anonymous coins, like dark coin, bitcoin dark, or crypto note, or monero. Um, these are not endorsements. I've, I have no idea what these coins are. They say they're anonymous, um, you know, it's up to you to trust the code. Um, so that's that's really what you have to do. You have to like jump through all these hoops if you actually want to be anonymous, at least until uh, these these uh, mixing services are properly uh, configured and properly Im implemented. Um, so what can exchanges do to help? Because like exchanges and wallet providers are really the point where like bitcoins and real identities tend to like mash together. Um, one thing that they can do is they can integrate open transactions, which offers like untraceable Chamian digital cash. So you can withdraw these cash tokens and trade them around with people, and then you know withdraw bitcoins later. 
um, and they use multi-sig voting pool. You, they can use multi-sig voting pools so that you don't have to uh, worry too much about your bitcoins uh, being goxed. Um, and uh, the, the exchanges can implement coin shuffle for all withdrawals. So like every time you withdraw bitcoins from the exchange to your personal wallet, they can be sent through coin shuffle uh, so that you know the exchange can't see uh, you know uh, uh, your or someone looking at the exchange's uh, addresses can't like find your new address that you sent the withdrawal to. Uh, they can ex retain as little data as possible. I don't even know how much data they're required to hold by law, but they should hold like the absolute minimum possible because like what do they really need it for right um, and of course they can also operate in more favorable jurisdictions for like financial privacy uh, that's probably the best thing they could do a further reading for this topic a great book by that security researcher I mentioned earlier Christoph Atlas it's called anonymous Bitcoin how to keep your bitcoins all to yourself definitely recommend you guys check that out so just as a some last-minute advice here uh, model your threats, you know, determine what's actually a threat and what's not. Um, and then you can kind of figure out what your security needs are from there. Use two-factor authentication on all of your accounts. Uh, use good passwords. Remember, like, uh, easy for you to remember, hard for uh, someone else or a computer to guess. Uh, use free open source software whenever possible because um, proprietary software could have Backdoors built into it, uh, backdoors installed on an update at any time. You just have no idea of knowing. And of course, keep all of your software up to date so that um, there's no like zero days or any sort of other like old exploits that uh, can be used to compromise uh, your computer. Um, one thing to keep in mind that it is possible to over secure. So, um, contrary to what you might read on the internet, you can have too much security, so like, be reasonable, be safe, most importantly, have fun, because you only live once, guys. <laughs> YOLO. You guys can get in touch with me if you want. Litecoin.in is my website, at Litecoin on Twitter, Litecoin on one name, and Litecoin on Ripple. Uh, thanks a lot for sticking around, folks. Uh, if you have any questions, we might have time for a few questions. Otherwise, I'll be around and you can come talk to me. Thank you. Español, English, Deutsch. Normalmente produzco solo videos en inglés y español. Normally I produce only videos in English and Spanish. Normalerweise produciré ich nur videos en English and Spanish. Pero hoy voy a hacer otra excepción y traducirlo también en alemán. But today I make another exception and translate it into German too. Aber heute werde ich nochmal eine Ausnahme machen und es auch in Deutsch übersetzen. Ja, algunas semanas tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de traducir el video hashtag BTC4. Now, already some weeks ago, I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich äh, auf meiner To-Do-Liste geschrieben, ähm, den Video BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. I'm sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten 
äh, finanziell helfen kann. Y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin. And give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und Motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im Moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my for the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgenden. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. Bitcoin adressen in Papier ausdrucken, um, minimum 10 or besser gleich 100. Y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero, and the next time uh, you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de propina en un restaurante. O maybe a tip in a restaurant. O da trinkgeld en restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin. De direcciones de Bitcoin. 
when you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin Adressen druckt, auch die äh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Address Schlüsseln ähm, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de abril 2015, escribir la fecha, más plus cuatro años, eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015, plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin eh, en estos cuatro años, yo lo vuelvo a tener, tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in, this, um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, schau, das ist der private Schlüssel. Um, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Schlüssel. Wenn du äh, bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way, you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. In mi video antigo. English, Espanol. Video mix number 25, video mix numero 25. This time I want to talk especially about hashtag JCCVW, which I created some time ago, abbreviation for Justice Court Comedy and Virtual Worlds. Esta vez quiero hablar especialmente sobre el tema hashtag JCCVW que el hashtag que he creado hace algún tiempo so, que, eh, y es la abreviación por eh, justicia, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds, eh, justicia, comedia de justicia en mundos virtuales. I made already several videos about this hashtag. Uh, ya he hecho varios videos sobre este hashtag. But this time, especially thinking of my last video, number 24, 
uh, robot ethics. Pero esta vez especialmente pensando en mi último video, uh, video mix número 24, Robot Ethics, e Ética de Robots. First, I want to mention uh, the episode of Simpsons, Treehouse of Horror, number 13. Primero quiero men mencionar el, el, epi el episodio de Simpsons, número 13, Treehouse of Horror, número 13. Just a side note, it's uh, astonishing uh, now many years in Spanish TV uh, and at lunchtime and in the evening they are still showing about half an hour or more uh, Simpsons, many years now. Uh, it's asombroso. Um, yeah, muchos años que por el mediodía y también por la por la noche enseñan por lo menos media hora de los Simpsons en la televisión española. Did you hear of the term Simpsonology? Has oído de, del término Simpsonología o Simpson Simpson Simpsonology Simpson. Simpsonology. Maybe I'll check out if it in Spanish. Simpsonología. Todavía. Long story short, the moral of the this episode of The Simpsons: the animals have more ethics than humans. Resumiendo este episodio de Los Simpsons, uh, los animales tienen más ética que los humanos. Remember my last video, number, video mix number 24, Robot Ethics, Cat Ethics. Recuerda mi uh, último video mix número 24, Robot Ethics, Ética de Robots and Cat Ethics, Ética de Gatos. And with a funny gif, GIF is abbreviation for Graphic Interchange Format. Y con un gracioso gif, GIF. Maybe it's a little bit helpful, helpful to compare robot ethics and cat ethics. Tal vez uh, ayuda a comparar un poco el ética de robots y ética de gatos. Once I said to my mom, uh, talking with this person is like uh, teaching, teaching ethics to cats. Una vez he dicho a mi madre, mira, hablando con esa persona es como uh, enseñar ética a, a gatos. They just do what they want. Solo simp simplemente hacen lo que quieren. And the robots do what they are programmed to do. Y los robots hacen simplemente lo que están programados de hacer. The question is the responsibility. La cuestión es la responsabilidad. So in the end, you see, it's almost not controllable. Así que verás que al final no es controlable. But normal cats can never turn as evil as humans. Pero gatos normales nunca pueden volverse tan eh, malos, hacer cosas tan malas como los humanos. Perversion, perversión, opposite land, el país de justo todo al revés. Copyright, copy prohibition. 
el copyright es más bien no un derecho de copiar, sino una prohibición de copia, copiar. Law of intellectual property, la ley de la propiedad intelectual. Especially because I like to produce video mix, I got very angry about the legal system and the perverse law of intellectual property which inhibits innovation and freedom of expression. Especialmente porque me gusta producir video mix. Uh, me enfadé con el sistema legal, en especialmente el especialmente la ley de la propiedad intelectual que inhibe la innovación y la libertad de expresión. And if you continue to think about the legal system, uh, you get more and more doubts. Y si continúas de pensar sobre el sistema legal, vas a tener más y más dudas. But still, you have, I think it's important to have a place to talk about ethics. Pero igualmente pienso que es importante de tener un lugar donde se hable sobre ética. That's the main motivation why I created hashtag JCCVW, Justice Card Comedy in Virtual Worlds. Es la motivación principal por la que he creado el hashtag JCCVW, Justice Card Comedy in Virtual Worlds, Justicia Comedia de justicia en mundos virtuales. Even on my main Twitter account, Planos Enigma, the cover picture, uh, I've got written justice. Who has the right to judge? Who is without sin? Cast the first stone. Hasta en mi cuenta de Twitter principal, Vanos Enigma, tengo el, el cover, la imagen de cover, escrito justicia. ¿Quién tiene el derecho de juzgar? ¿Quién esté sin pecado que tire la primera piedra? And it's astonishing how often the Simpsons show some kind of court comedies. Y es asombroso cuántas veces en los Simpsons enseñan algún tipo de comedias de juicios. I want to remember especially the lawsuit or court comedy of Homer Simpson when he sold his soul to the devil, Ned Flanders. Especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Homer Simpson cuando vendió su alma al diablo, uh, Ned Flanders. En normal legal system, the question is always, is it legal or is it illegal? En el sistema legal, eh, normalmente la cuestión pregunta es, ¿es legal o es ilegal? But it's more important to ask, is it, is it ethical, is it right or is it wrong? Es más importante preguntar, es, ¿está bien o mal? ¿Es ético o no, no es ético? Did you hear of the term jury nullification? Has oído de este término, ahora no sé en español, pero eh, uno tiene el derecho de decir que, por ejemplo, no culpable porque la ley es injusta. 
you have the right to say it's uh, not guilty because the law is not just unjust. I want to remember especially the case of Ross Albrecht, Free Ross, hashtag Free Ross, Dread Pirate, Silk Road, especially I want to remember the case of Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road, Bitcoin, and my profile picture of Innocent Crypto Kitty and my image and profile Innocent Crypto Kitty who wants to be a cat innocent of cryptography But it's medical catnip Where is catnip medical? 30 years of jail for running a website which other people used for buying and selling catnip. 30 años de cárcel por hacer una página web que otras personas han usado para comprar y vender catnip. And I want to remember what uh, said Roger Ware, uh, Bitcoin Jesus. He said something like, uh, the war against drugs cause more harm than the drugs themselves. Y quiero recordar lo que dijo Roger Ware, que es como el Bitcoin, el Jesús de Bitcoin, Dijo algo como que la guerra contra las drogas causan más daño que las drogas mismas. Okay, let's go back to even if you would have want to have a person like ah and not just Roger Ware uh, the case of Charlie Shrin, another Bitcoiner. A very interesting case too and one interview um, I made a video um, very interesting comment of Andreas Antonopoulos in one episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin I think it's the video mix number Yes, I had just a look. It's video mix number 17. Uh, justo he mirado es el video mix número 17 uh, con Charlie Shrem. Uh, this comment I like too much, so I will paste it. Uh, just paste it here. Este comentario me gusta demasiado, así que uh, algunos minutos voy a pegar. Este momento. And, uh, podcasts can agree to the fact that whatever we have in this country that passes for a justice system has at least three tiers. There are, you know, uh, people at the top who get infinite, infinite forgiveness for some of the most disgusting mega crimes and never face the tiniest consequence for their actions. You can put a million people out of their homes with fraudulent foreclosures. And you'll never see the inside of a courtroom. You can rig markets, steal money from investors, defraud millions of people. You'll never see the inside of a courtroom. And yet... There's the other side of the scale where you have a situation of zero tolerance, where the slightest infraction, selling a loose cigarette for 30 cents, gets you a street side arrest judgment and execution by strangulation, where jaywalking gets you shot by a cop, even if you're unarmed, and where cities run effectively debtors prisons where they rotate people through there for traffic fines and keep accumulating them until they end up in jail 
for violating subpoenas and things like that, and run it as a for-profit enterprise. And then in the middle is the middle class, caught in this justice system, this thin layer that's getting thinner all the time because they're getting squeezed from the bottom. And the middle class sees the top of this country getting away with uh, mega crimes and sees a wave of zero tolerance coming at them that used to only affect minorities, but now is increasingly taking bites out of the middle class. And they're struggling desperately not to fall into this Orwellian zero tolerance justice system. That's not justice. I think everyone on this call probably has a similar perspective to this, but effectively what we're talking about is an erosion of the rule of law. And the most fundamental concept of the rule of law is equality in judgment. If a law exists, there is one tier. Everybody faces the same consequences for breaking that law. And that fundamental social compact has been violated. And for some stratum of the society, it never really existed. You know, Some people were always going to feel the heavy boot of law um, with no recourse and um, suffered under that for 200 years. Uh, but now that is increasingly becoming the vast majority of the population. So you live in a society where the slightest mistake is very harshly punished. That's if you survive the police encounter. Um, while you watch a country's so-called elite just roll from scandal to scandal, from crime to crime, with no one going to jail. War crimes, no jail time. Bank fraud, no jail time. All of these things, you know, surveillance and violating the constitutional rights of millions of people, not even a misdemeanor issue. It just gets legalized after the fact. Lying to Congress, no problem. And then Preet can promote his resume by going after Charlie. It's really a disgusting situation, but I think it's, it's a situation that has nothing to do with Bitcoin per se. It's just a universal collapse of justice and the rule of law in this country. One of the few countries that actually had it. As that was so well said, I have no response to it. I, I completely agree with Andreas, everything he just said. It's, it's, it's not limited to, to Bitcoin. It's, a, it's an overall, you see it, you see it with everything. I mean, look at the case of Aaron Schwartz. May he rest in peace. But once they have their sights on you, telling it's you per se, I think it's what you represent or who you are. Um, there's no getting out of those sites, and the higher up you are, the harder it is for them to prosecute you. It just doesn't make sense for them. Our justice system has been corrupted or viewed to, to, to what it is today, and I created the hashtag Let's Talk Justice, or maybe a better hashtag Let's Talk Ethics. I also created a hashtag Let's Talk Justice, Let's Talk Justice, but I think it's better Let's Talk Ethics, Let's Talk Justice. After this part of video mix number 17, I will paste a short video comparison of the two uh, websites of Wikipedia about this episode of Simpson Treehouse of Horror number 13. Y después de esa parte de video mix número 17 voy a pegar un pequeño video en una comparación entre las dos páginas de Wikipedia en inglés, en español, 
I forgot to say in English, in comparison between English and Spanish of the episode of The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror and eh, perdón, Español ahora. Eh, comparación del episodio de Simpson Treehouse of Horror número 13. Comparing hashtag JCCVW to uh, the real legal system, of course, there is no such thing like judgment, rather a fiction punishment. Comparando JCCVW, uh, comparándolo con el sistema legal, uh, por supuesto no hay tal cosa como un, una sentencia de juicio, más bien un, un castigo ficticio. Just want to remember you, I have that uh, Twitter account Soul Trade Game in virtual worlds like Second Life with, with Virtual Guide Dog. Uh, recordar que tengo la cuenta en Twitter que se llama Soul Trade Game, traducido Juego de Negocios de Almas. Es como un juego en mundos virtuales como Second Life. Especially interesting for cats and blind people. Especialmente interesante para gatos y personas que estén ciegos o tengan problemas con los ojos. Or people blind or people who have problems with the eyes. Uh, anyway, watch my videos about Soul Trade Game. De todas formas, mirad mis videos sobre Soul Trade Game, juego de negocio de almas. And I have that Twitter account, Soul, uh, sorry, Soul Confiscator Catch. Y tengo este, esta cuenta de Twitter, Soul Confiscator Catch. You are welcome on all of my Twitter accounts. Normally I follow back. Estáis bienvenidos en todas mis cuentas de Twitter. Normalmente sigo de vuelta. So you see I have a double or triple interest to open hashtag JCCVW. Así que... Veis que tengo un doble o triple interés de abrir el hashtag JCCVW, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds. Ah, what I wanted to say before about the jury nullification. Uh, if you really would like to, to um, participate in... Uh, trial, lawsuit, uh, to help uh, somebody from getting declared guilty fast, you have to take vacation, you have to buy a flight to New York, and I think this trial was in January of um, Free Ross, Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road. So, bueno, lo que iba a decir antes uh, con respecto al derecho de, uh, de renalification en español, no me acuerdo, so, no estoy segura, pero que tienes el derecho de decir que mira, yo estoy, uh, no estoy de acuerdo que esta persona sea declarada culpable. Así que primero tendrías que tomar vacaciones, comprar un vuelo a Nueva York. Y eh, era ese juicio, me parece, era en, en enero cuando hizo un montón de frío. So comparing this legal system with uh, 
hashtag JCCVW, this is in, in, in virtual worlds. Everybody can participate and talk about ethics, right or wrong, don't need to buy a flight to New York. Uh, comparando ahí con el sistema legal, no, eso tiene que tiene lugar en mundos virtuales, no hay que comprar un vuelo a Nueva York y tanto, tanto esfuerzo para participar en un juicio, discutir sobre ética. Puedes fácilmente participar de cualquier lugar, ordenador, P2P, and especially talking about robot ethics, this will be very important in the future. Y especialmente el tema de ética de robots en el futuro será muy importante. Because it's easy to say that the person who programmed the robot is responsible for the actions, but uh, it's very easy to uh, to hide the identity who programmed the robot. Es muy fácil decir que la persona que ha programado el robot es responsable por las acciones del robot, pero es muy fácil de ocultar la identidad de la persona que ha programado el robot.